G'day guys. So it's been an interesting couple of months for Henry Cavill, the man who, at least in the opinion of this jellyfish, should be king of Hollywood. First and foremost, after two seasons of less than faithful Witcher adaptation on the 30th of October 22, Cavill announced that he would be leaving the series after season three. This wasn't a surprise to many, noting that Cavill had been at odds with the showrunners over the script since season one. Genuinely a fan of the books and the, and the game and everything. Apparently on set, you know more than anyone else. I wouldn't necessarily say anyone else, but I, I but am yes. a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a big fan. Yes. I'm a big fan. Yeah. So do you correct people? Um, I don't necessarily... <laughs> I, I am effusive about getting the... Uh, being, being loyal to the source material. Let's put it that way. Going out of his way, in fact, to ensure that the show respected and adhered to the lore of the novels. His departure from the series actually initiated a poll to sack the writers and ensure Cavill remained. Personally, I felt Cavill did an excellent job playing Geralt of Rivia and would have continued to do so. If only the showrunners had had the same passion for the source material as Cavill did. In fact, that passion was apparently labelled toxic by some of the show's staff, but we'll touch on that a little bit later. Shortly after this announcement, another, slightly more optimistic announcement came downrange, not long after the release of Black Adam in theatres. Spoilers ahead. Black Adam. We should talk. After a turbulent period, including several films hitting the chopping block under new management at Warner Brothers, Cavill revealed that he would be once again donning the red cape to play Superman. Hey everyone. I wanted to wait until the weekend was over before posting this, uh, because I wanted to give you all a chance to watch Black Adam. But now that plenty of you have, I wanted to make it official that I am back as Superman. And the image you see on this post and what you saw in Black Adam are just a very small taste of things to come. So uh, there's a lot to be thankful for and I'll get to that in time. But I want to thank you guys most of all. Thank you for your support and thank you for your patience. I promise it will be rewarded. For the most part, this was met with elation because despite Snyder's unique and somewhat polarising take on the Justice League, Cavill is uniquely suited to play Superman. He's tall, dark and handsome in the old English and has endeared himself to his fans through countless interviews. I mean, if, even if you don't get it, there's some cameras here and there are people at home who will get it. Okay. Do you know Warhammer at all, Warhammer 40,000, that kind of stuff? That Not world? the, the greatest expert. Okay, so, that, that's yeah. fine, that's fine. There's people at home who are just gone, oh yeah. yeah they're, they're... <laughs> Fly your nerd flag with pride. Yes. What, now, one of your hobbies, and he's got a lot of them, ladies and gentlemen, one of your hobbies is you paint... Makes me sound you... weird. Ben's a very large man. Yes, that surprised me is, the most. Isn't he? I, I was, I You're was a very large man. <laughs> thank, th thank you very much. In a good way, in a yes. good way. <laughs> Thank you very much as well. Coming yes. out all yeah. wrong. I was going to say, sort of steady on. Revealing himself to be a very genuine human. No, actually, I talk to my dog a lot, so <laughs> it's it's actually it's quite familiar for me. What's your dog's name? Cal. Oh, what kind of dog is it? He's an American Akita. Oh, cool. He would normally be here, but he's at the vet today. <laughs> I would love to interview him next time. Yeah, he's, please bring him along. He's, he's not great on camera. <laughs> It's no surprise, then, that many consider Cavill to be one of the internet's sweethearts, up there with Keanu Reeves and Brendan Fraser. Naturally, his cameo and Instagram announcement were met with excitement, but with also more questions than answers. Would the DCEU return? Would it be a soft reboot? What about Gal Gadot's Wonder Woman and Affleck's Batman? Well, the answer came swift and hard from James Gunn on the 8th of December. We are not going to please everyone. This is also supported by an article released earlier in the month stating that Wonder Woman 1984 would not be getting a sequel. Jeez, Patty Jenkins can't catch a break, eh? Now, according to The Wrap, the director apparently walked away from the project after many of the higher-ups cast doubt on some of her ideas. Now, according to an insider source, upon receiving some skepticism on her direction, Jenkins was very vocal about letting Warner Brothers CEOs know that they didn't understand the character or the overall character arc she had in mind for Wonder Woman. And according to this insider, Jenkins also sent an email to one of the CEOs and ended it with a Wikipedia link to the definition of character arc to further emphasize their lack of understanding. That's what it says on Wikipedia. Yeah, Sorry. Wikipedia? <laughs> You're using Wikipedia as your source of information. 
So now Cavill's decision made a little bit more sense, at least in terms of putting bread on the table. Leave the Witcher, where he felt the source material was being subverted. If life could give me one blessing, it would be to take you off my hands. In favour of DC, where under the guidance of James Gunn and Peter Safran, he would get another shot at the Man of Steel. WRONG! On the 15th of December, Cavill announced via his Instagram again that he would not be in fact returning as Superman, despite already appearing in Black Adam, following discussions with James Gunn. Fuck. The new DC studio managers, Gunn and Safran, are allegedly going in a different direction with Superman. A younger approach, if you will. Rather than the peak of human performance and utter monument to masculinity that is Henry Cavill. This election was no surprise to me, noting how Hollywood is trending in terms of casting lead male actors. But again, I'll touch on that later. So it seemed a soft reboot for the DCEU was now off the cards. As I've stated before, I'm not a gambling jellyfish, but I'm guessing that the fact that Black Adam didn't do too well at the box office really hurt Cavill's chances of remaining as Superman. Great work. Dwayne, you entrepreneurial plank. Stick to your rock in the jungle movies and your tequila peddling. Sidebar, The Rock and Henry Cavill have the same manager. Or, more appropriately, had the same manager. It's no wonder Henry Cavill was passed over for so many lead roles, noting The Rock's relationship with Danny Garcia. But that is a story for another time. Anyway, in the ashes of now two iconic characters, Henry chose to rise and give life to something else. A little passion project that he's been working on. Talk about snatching victory from the jaws of defeat. Holy shit. For those of you who don't know, Cavill is a massive 40k fan, and it's been his dream to bring Warhammer to the big screen since he was a child. I, I, and I love it. And I've um, that's the stuff I've done in, as far as hobby stuff, the stuff which my escapism is concerned. Um, all, the, all the reading I do outside of work is normally based around that or fantasy authors. Um, so, yeah, and I've been, I've been involved in the Warhammer world for... 40,000 years. 40,000 years. Oh, well, longer, depending how you look at it. Um, but uh, since I was probably 10. Nice. Yeah, so a long time. Given that Cavill has gone on record several times stating that the fans should come first and that the law is sacrosanct when it comes to adapting anything. Where, like, if you make a movie, especially if you make a superhero movie, it does, like, you have great intentions, but there are always going to be a small yet vocal group of people there can kind of just be toxic. I understand what you're saying, but when it comes to fans, it is a fan's right mm -hmm. to have whatever opinion they want to have. And people are going to be upset because, especially when it, you're talking about books or games, because you're never going to be the exact person who they had in their head or who they played on Witcher 3, for example. I don't necessarily consider that toxic. I just consider that passionate. Was that difficult? And how much pressure did you feel from this rabid fandom that loves this story so much? I didn't feel any pressure at all. Okay. I mean, and if I did, it's coming from myself. I'm one of these fans. I, I, am, I am one of them, 100%. Rabidly enthusiastic mm -hmm. about doing the right thing for this show. And I've, I've been a fan of the fantasy genre since I was a boy. Mm -hmm. And a big fan of the games and a huge fan of the books as well. And so for me, I am, I'm in the same boat as them. Yeah. Like, no prisoners. I am more than optimistic that his 40K series is going to be something very special. I know there may be some apprehension given that Cavill is working with Amazon to bring his series to life. And given their recent track record, I can understand that. But put aside the fact that Amazon is footing the bill for a moment. And remember that money doesn't buy talent, nor does it buy passion. Given that Cavill was willing to walk away from a steady paycheck with The Witcher, rather than be a part of what he considered a non-faithful adaptation, demonstrates that Cavill is a man who places the law of an IP ahead of his own wallet. And that can only come from a place of passion, not of greed. Remember, The Witcher was a must-win for Netflix, and multiple seasons and spin-offs have already been agreed to. Whether or not they continue after Cavill's departure, and whatever the hell this garbage was. Seven warriors, outcasts, strangers to each other, bound together to fight an unstoppable empire. I guess we'll just have to wait and see. However, my money's on no. It's kind of funny how all these shows popped up in the wake of Game of Thrones season eight in an attempt to cash in on the fantasy audience, and only one of them has come even remotely close to recapturing the magic, and that is House of the Dragon, which given how season eight of Game of Thrones ended, was no small task and still has a massive hill to climb in terms of bringing back their scorned audience. The rest of them, despite having fantastic, rich, and widely enjoyed source material, have been 
butchered, whether intentionally or through malpractice, in the name of making a quick dollar off an established fan base. So while I'm super excited to see Cavill's 40k series come to fruition, I encourage everyone to remain wary of any big studio producing modern entertainment. But, as many of you may have guessed, I actually have something that I want to talk about, and that thing is Hollywood's apparent dislike of Henry Cavill. Or, more accurately, what he represents in terms of the growing pop culture war. Stick with me on this one, guys. It requires a little bit of galaxy brain, and the last thing I want to do is sound like a conspiracy theorist, but there are certain pieces of this puzzle that are lining up just at the right time for me to suspect that there may be more to this theory than just my brainless wonderings. If we can hit that bullseye, the rest of the dominoes will fall like a house of cards. Checkmate. <sighs> As always, I don't expect you to just take my word for it, so I'll be providing a little bit of evidence along the way as well. Firstly, the Cavill cancellation attempts. There's only been a couple of glancing blows towards Henry Cavill in terms of cancellations, and both of them are rather innocuous once you realise how much evidence there is to support the opposite of the claims that were made against him. But the first was around the time of the hashtag me too pandemic. Cavill made some comments that were more or less akin to a granddad talking about how they met someone's grandmother. But he said the Me Too movement has made him reluctant to approach women. The controversy came from an interview that he had with GQ Australia. He said, I think a woman should be wooed and chased, but maybe I'm old fashioned for thinking that. He went on to say the Me Too climate makes it difficult because, quote, I don't want to go up and talk to her because I'm going to be called a rapist or something. And apparently this was enough to deem him toxic and worthy of cancellation. That is, of course, until Henry, in classic form, fell on his sword and apologised for the inappropriate comments. It certainly helped that he is very endearing in almost every interview that he gives. The second side swipe came at him not long after he left the Witcher series. Rather than paraphrasing, I located the podcast from which these claims appeared and I'll play them for you why Henry Cavill left The Witcher. And I just recently got this message. So let me just read it. At the beginning of the show, Henry was good to work with. A lot of difficult demands that made people feel like he wasn't really a team player, but that's not unusual for a big star. Though in TV, it truly usually doesn't happen until the second season. But in season two and three, something shifted and he became really impossible for women to work with, which is always a big problem. But even worse here because the showrunner is a woman. He would try to overrule her and try to get changes made last minute across the board without her knowledge, which if you know anything about showrunning is completely fucked. The showrunner has to sign off on every minuscule detail down to the buttons on a costume. Female writers directors were suddenly being completely ignored on set, unable to do their jobs. Every department head was complaining. He started making comments. It wasn't a sexual thing. He wasn't grabbing anyone or being lewd, but it was disrespectful and toxic all the same. He is deeply addicted to video games to the point where it was like working with any other addict. He was distracted. He was late. He was obsessive. And a lot of people think that the misogyny came from gamer world. Video game bro language is not how you talk to coworkers, and he wouldn't stop. Someone on the show compared it to watching someone get brainwashed by QAnon, like his whole personality shifted. Eventually, his disrespect escalated. He would rewrite scenes without even alerting the other actors in the scenes until it was time to shoot. He decided that he didn't want any romantic scenes at all. No kissing, no shirtless scenes, etc. He wanted complete control of storylines, but really had no idea of the limitations of TV, structure, budget, etc. He formed a weird alliance with one writer, who was also a gamer, who eventually got fired after multiple HR complaints were made. And after that writer left, Henry did anything he could to hold up production and cause problems. Eventually, Top Brass at Netflix was tired of him costing them money with delays in HR investigations and the showrunner was asked to construct a potential exit for him. Netflix reached out to him personally, and he was given one final warning and violated that warning with an email he sent to the entire writing staff right after that meeting. That was it. 
it's very disappointing. This podcast is what I was alluding to earlier in the video, but given what we've seen from the clips that I've played, does this really seem like something Henry Cavill would be doing on the set of The Witcher? Mr. Excessively Polite, Well-Spoken and Well-Thought? Mm, I don't think so. I absolutely believe that Henry was telling the writers that they were getting it wrong and he was adamant that the source material should be adapted faithfully, but in terms of toxic gamer language and misogyny, <laughs> yeah, sure. This reminds me of all those articles that prop up every time there's a school shooting in America and they blame GTA. As it turns out, these comments were quickly rescinded after there was a bit of blowback on towards the individual that shared this podcast. But I guess the real question is, why demonize Henry Cavill? He's basically the human equivalent of a golden retriever. Defender of the innocent, protector of the weak, and all around good guy. Henry Cavill. But this is where we go a little bit galaxy brain. Think of the kind of characters that Henry Cavill is suited to play. Tall, dark and handsome, hyper-masculine, and basically a really good role model for all young men coming through. In a very real sense, Henry Cavill is the exemplar of what it means to be a masculine male. But in the modern era, being masculine is problematic and toxic. There has been a gradual societal shift away from elements of masculinity over the last 30 years, and Hollywood is a good place to analyse that. You need look no further than the Phase 4 Marvel films. The MCU more or less kicked off with masculine characters, your Tony Stark, your Thor and your Captain America, just as a quick example. But by the end of Phase 4, nearly all the male characters had a female counterpart or female replacement in some cases. This by itself is not necessarily a problem because we're all about inclusivity, but when the male characters in the films all of a sudden become dunces and comic relief rather than being, I don't know, a masculine man with any sense of agency, that's when we get a problem. All of a sudden, any role model that would have existed within the MCU for young boys is thrown out the window in favour of a powerful woman who acts more like a man. Wanna fight? And not a good man, like the worst qualities of toxic masculinity man. Looking at you, Brie Larson. Uh, it's just a fact, it's not a personal opinion. No, and it's no, not no. a reflection on what you can't do, but it is also kind of a reflection on all that you can't do. It's just that you're, you're just, you're just not that strong. This trend extends further than replacing male heroes with female ones. Once hyper-masculine bastions like James Bond are now being replaced or recalibrated for a modern audience because the perception of modern society is that these male archetypes are no longer appropriate. As a result, you don't have classic leading men in films anymore because their traits are problematic, particularly when it comes to traits of masculinity. What you have instead are quote-unquote strong female characters who act more like toxically masculine men or boys slash effeminate men in the role of leading men. Who, in most instances, are easily put down by their superior female counterpart. You didn't want to be king in the north. What happens when they demand you press your claim and take what is mine? I refuse. You are my queen. I don't know what else I can say. You can say nothing to anyone ever. Never tell them who you really are. While I'm sure this trend was born out of a desire to do good and put more women in filmmaking, it's actually counterproductive to good storytelling because your strong female characters don't have an equivalent on the other side of the spectrum. They're not challenged by a male equivalent on the other side, or by anything for that matter. Therefore, they can just walk to their goal without any challenge. And when a character doesn't struggle to reach their goal, we don't sympathize with them. Therefore, you don't get a genuine payoff of emotion at the end of the film. But the modern unwritten rules of Hollywood is that a female can't lose a fight to a man or be in any way, shape or form influenced by a man, whether negatively or positively. We rarely get to see women be vulnerable, lose, have a weak moment, express emotion, emote, because they need to be as alpha as possible in order to remain seen as strong as possible. They're always right, they don't lose, they're girl bosses, they're girls who have power, they're strong, they kick ass, they kick men's ass, they don't fall under man, they don't kneel before man, they don't need a man. Because men make us weak, because all men are sexist and hide under our beds to scream at us in the middle of the night. 
right? So characters like a hyper-masculine Superman is problematic for the modern rules. So how do you get around that if you're trying to put Superman in a movie? Well, you sacrifice the absolute bastion of masculinity that is Henry Cavill in favour of someone younger, thereby making sure that this younger, slightly effeminate and emasculated hero is easily influenced by strong female characters. Just take a look at Spider-Man as an example of what I'm talking about. The three eras of Maguire, Garfield and Holland demonstrate this trend quite clearly. In the beginning, you had Peter Parker played by Tobey Maguire, and as you can see quite clearly, quite a masculine man. He was influenced by a father figure, and he had a strong counterbalance in his Mary Jane. Yeah, alright, maybe that's not quite true. She was a bit useless in the trilogy. But you can see what I'm talking about. Strong male character, influenced by a grandfather figure, and a damsel in distress. Compare this to the Garfield era, where you have a younger Spider-Man, who is offset by a very strong Gwen, who is influenced by both a mother and a father figure. Unlike the Mary Jane in the Tobey Maguire era, Gwen is is far from a damsel in distress in these films. Wait there for eight minutes after what I just told you. People are gonna die. You leave right now. Oh, this that is an order, okay? I'm gonna get everybody out. Did you hear? Gwen, Gwen, you mother hubbard, you see? You can already see the scales beginning to balance here between the influences on the protagonist. And at a 50-50 split, that's not too bad. Actually, it's more like two to one. Is Uncle Ben's death still a spoiler at this point? Hey! Arriving at the Holland era, you have, again, a younger Spider-Man who is influenced by a strong, foxy, single mum type character with the added benefit of a bungling male sidekick. Yes, Tony Stark is there, and yes, I guess he's loosely a mentor, but he's more of an enabler in terms of giving Peter his equipment versus an actual emotional motivator. If you removed him from the equation, Peter would still be trying to be Spider-Man, just with less gear. So in that sense, his character as a mentor, quote-unquote, is less relevant to what I'm talking about than Peter's emotional family unit. And without sidebarring too much, he was basically just used as a vehicle to insert Spider-Man into the MCU, but anyway. And a Mary Jane, who is arguably smarter than he is. So you've come from what would be argued as traditional gender roles in the Maguire era to a very modern sense of sensibility in the new films. With instead of a stoic masculine hero that hides his emotions to be strong for others, you have an emotionally vulnerable boy leaning on his support network. That is a strong female character. I'm not throwing shade at any of the Spider-Man movies in particular, and certainly not the MCU version specifically. I'm merely pointing out the differences in the portrayal of your leading man across the three different generations, and how it is reflective of social norms in terms of accepted masculinity. It's not a coincidence that Spider-Man went from a masculine man mentored by a male archetype mentor in as early as 2002 to a vulnerable, emotional and boyish Spider-Man emotionally supported by two strong female characters in the post-2016 hashtag MeToo world. This trend in filmmaking is a byproduct of the societal change that has been occurring over the last couple of decades. In an era where everyone gets a ribbon for participating rather than being rewarded for hard work. So if they're not rewarded for hard work, they don't need to be challenged. Therefore, they don't struggle and they don't grow. So young boys and even young girls don't need to get fitter, faster and stronger to achieve what they're after because they'll get a ribbon regardless. All scientific advancement due to intelligence overcoming, compensating for limitations. Can't carry a load, so invent wheel. Can't catch food, so invent spear. Limitations. No limitations, no advancement. No advancement, culture stagnates. They're also constantly affirmed that everybody is special and there's nothing wrong with your body type. There's no criticism because even slight criticism is labeled bullying and because someone hasn't been challenged at all in their entire life, they don't know how to deal with criticism. So they go through their entire schooling career thinking they're special and they don't need to challenge themselves or try hard to be the best at anything. They then finish school and go straight into film school, again, part of the system that is trending in a direction where no one is challenged or criticised. And because they've been told their entire life that you can do anything if you set your mind to it, they believe this. So their understanding of what makes a strong character, male or female, is warped, skewed and incorrect because their definition of struggle and hardship is not aligned to what came before. It is watered down. Hardship formally meaning that you would struggle to provide food for your family in the depression post-World War II. Versus now where hardship looks like someone getting your pronouns wrong and the price of a latte going up at Starbucks. This is how you see fights in films that look like they've been written by someone who's never even seen a fight in person because you can't fight anymore. Being strong and fighting is a toxic trait and we can't have that in the modern era. And when they reach the end of film school and start producing their own films... 
having not experienced what it means to struggle and grow, their films lack authenticity because their characters have a skewed sense of what it means to be challenged and they have no idea what an actual strong character looks like. This is how you end up with shows like The Witcher where the strong male character who is meant to be the centerpiece of the show takes a back seat in favour of all the drama generated by the female characters in the show. Drama, that when compared to the context of the stakes of the show itself, means very little, but because these writers and directors don't have relevant life experience to compare to something with actual high stakes, this is what you end up with. And because they don't know what masculinity looks like, because it was basically outlawed in the schooling system, it means that they've never really had a strong male role model, which means they're incapable of writing a strong male character that doesn't come across looking like a meme. So when a six-foot broad-shouldered high hyper-masculine Henry Cavill turns up on the set and starts to explain to the production team that he understands the character better than they do because they've moved through their entire life without being challenged in any way shape or form they see this as an attack. I'm genuinely surprised that they didn't use the word mansplained. Toxic bro gamer language is probably Henry sitting down and saying no Geralt wouldn't do that for the following reasons but rather than take a man's advice on what a man should be it's easier to demonize him and label him a sexist therefore you don't have to work with this problematic man in future. The issue is though when you start throwing shade at someone like Henry Cavill who is the king of the nerds, the nerds won't stand for it. People can see that Cavill is just like them, that he loves his intellectual properties law and he'll do anything to jealously defend it, even if that means walking away from a dream job. This is why Henry Cavill is a problem for Hollywood because he represents everything that they fear. A masculine man who understands what it means to be a gentleman and cares about the law of an intellectual property who has a a massive following of fans who more importantly will walk away from a project if he feels like the IP is not being respected and is being padded with modern sensibilities sensibilities that include an aversion to masculinity for which he could literally be a poster boy for with modern and entitled writers who don't understand what a strong character is because they've never been challenged in their life coupled with the desire to subvert and warp what once was into something different and acceptable by today's standards and a goal of doing something new and different with an intellectual property because in most cases modern writers are too lazy to do any research into the established law and canon, Henry Cavill would be seen as the very definition of problematic. Because he's not a six foot tall, sexist, toxic representation of hypermasculinity. It turns out he's a charming and well-spoken nerd who just wants to do a good job and give the fans what they want. And if the studio system's not going to do it for you... Fine. I'll do it myself. And up until this point, Hollywood has done their best to squander Cavill's talents and underutilize him in absolutely every capacity. As I said, without trying to sound like a conspiracy theorist, it wouldn't be difficult to believe that Hollywood had an agenda against Henry Cavill due to him being a masculine man, whether unconsciously or deliberately, and as a result, the threat that he would undoubtedly represent to the agenda-pushing modern-day Hollywood. We believe there's even a 1% chance that he is our enemy. We have to take it as an absolute certainty. But I'm glad he stepped out of his lane and is standing up to fight for what the fans actually want. Good on you, Henry Cavill, you bloody legend. Thank you for your support and thank you for your patience. I promise it will be rewarded. As you may have guessed, I'm very passionate about the portrayal of strong characters in modern films. And evidently, I have a bias and preference towards strong leading men, noting I grew up with a plethora to choose from and my colour palette is blue. And this is partly because to have actual strong and believable female characters, you need to have the same on the other side. The evolution of accepted masculinity in film and the rise of toxic feminism, which is often used as a shield against poor writing, is a volatile subject and I accept that my take may be a bit too spicy for some. Regardless, it's worth talking about until the pendulum has swung back the other way and everything is balanced again. Actually, balanced again might not be the right term, given that the scales have never truly been balanced before. But hopefully we're making some progress in that regard. As for you guys, thank you very much for listening to my rant. It went a little bit longer than I had originally intended. If you haven't already done so, feel free to drop a sub into the sheltered harbour, like, look or comment. The Series 2 of the Halo TV show is fastly approaching, and undoubtedly they will further debauch my favourite sci-fi franchise, so any help and support you guys can give me in the battle against that would be greatly appreciated. But remember... I'm just a brainless lump who's very excited to see how Henry Cavill's 40k series is going to turn out. Uru, my friend.